Exactly. If not, I'm going to make sure I do. Okay, we're good. Okay, welcome everybody. We got a uh, very big guest list tonight. So we're going to give everybody a minute or two to get settled. Opening night of the National Football League. So we probably got uh, some distracted um, attendees tonight, but uh, let's, let's give everybody just a second here and then we will dive in because we have a lot to cover in a relatively short period of time. Um, and for those of you that are not with us live tonight, and even for those of you that are, everything is going to be recorded. Uh, so you will get an email follow up with this recording along with the slides. And you also have the opportunity, um, I'm just going to say out of the gates that you know, we're trying to cover as much information as possible in a relatively short window. We're not going to get to everything. You're likely going to have questions that are specific to your situation or your family that might not get covered um, in that uh, detail tonight, but you're going to have the opportunity to meet with uh, us on an individual basis after the fact, should you choose. And, and again, we'll elaborate on that uh, after we get off tonight. But um, Without further ado, I, I, I want to get into it. So uh, I'm Matt Carpenter with College Funding Services. I think most of you uh, checking in right now know me. Some of you know me uh, very well, and it's been many, many years, and, and hopefully you've had a, a great experience to date, and that's why you're with us, and some of you are, are relatively new. And, you know, we have, we've been around for 15 years, and, and we think that we walk the walk in terms of being experts in this college space. And, and I think we do a great job. And again, for those of you that are new, we, we have to prove it all the way through, but our, our confidence is very high. Um, but we've, we've always grappled with the fact that right now, for all of you, college is the focus, or, or you've just finished with that piece, or you're in the middle of it. Um, and that's been the, the center of your attention as it should be. But our challenge has been, you know, the fact that w you can't look at this massive investment and challenge in a vacuum, right? College impacts your retirement and there could be tax implications. And, and we have to look at this thing uh, and take a holistic approach. But our, our kind of weakness, our blind spot uh, as a firm, in my opinion, has been that that's, we're not experts in that field. We're just experts uh, in our field, the college piece. And we're, we've had a shortfall. I think when we look at that holistic piece. So it's been several years. I mean, a lot of you that I know are, are on here tonight have heard me say this many, many times and, and you've expressed kind of some excitement and you've been happy for us because you know we've been on the trail looking for uh, experts in, in, in more comprehensive financial planning that have been in that space for a long time, but also have uh, and are very well versed and have experience in this college space. So. This last year has been really exciting for us because we bought, brought in, I think, uh, three thoroughbreds uh, in both the college space, but, but more importantly, at least for us and our shortcomings, the overall comprehensive financial planning space. So uh, some of you are already familiar with these guys, but um, uh, they're each going to introduce themselves as they tackle a, a piece of the presentation tonight. But we have uh, Josh Bennett joining us from the Midwest. We have Jim Femia, just north of Boston and Marblehead, Mass. We have John Mulney down DTS, down the shore in uh, New Jersey. And uh, we're super excited to have these guys be a part of our team at College Funding Services. And, um, you know, I'm going to stay out of their way tonight and let them take it away. And, and, and again, they're the experts around figuring out not just this college piece, but how does this impact uh, the rest of kind of our uh, financial existence. So uh, super excited to have these guys present to you. And I think you're going to learn a lot. And again, anything you don't learn, you can follow up and ask any further questions at a later date. Thanks, guys. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is John Munley, and I am the co-founder of Wealth Advisors. Um, this is my second career. Previously, I was a currency trader for 25 years and I've been a financial planner for the last five or six years. Um, but most importantly, I have sat where you're sitting right now. Uh, I'm currently putting three daughters through college. So I understand the anxiety you're going through and figuring out how I'm going to pay for all this. And I will tell you, it is definitely possible. So hopefully with the help of CFS, um, we can kind of guide you along the way and, and get you to where you want to go with your kids. Um, so let's kick it off with this and 
First thing we're gonna talk about, jump right into loans. So student loan debt in our country exceeds 1.7 trillion. It's the largest amount of debt. It exceeds credit card debt, um, all other debt out there. Um, it's a big problem and there doesn't look to be any solution to the end, to the end of it. So it's kind of how do you find how do you find good schools at great values? And again, that's something that, you know, CFS really works with their clients, as you guys know, to, to kind of find that um, match. Um, so let's start with Parent PLUS loans. Um, they're loans that are taken out in parents' names on behalf of the students. There are less, less flexible payment options in student loans, and the interest rates are typically higher than student loans. Now, before anybody starts to think about whether or not we should take Parent PLUS loans or not to pay for college, there's some questions uh, for parents to definitely just consider. Um, the first one is, will it put your retirement at risk? I'm sure many of you have heard the saying that you can't borrow for retirement, but you can borrow uh, for college. Um, that's absolutely true. Um, your child especially can always borrow money and they have a much longer runway to pay that off than parents do, especially as they get closer and closer to retirement. Some of the other questions are, do you have other debts that you would have to pay off if you did take a Parent PLUS loan? Uh, can you afford to make these payments? Um, some of them can be very high, depending on the loan size that you take. Uh, will you have an emergency cushion? So if something sudden happens, will you have enough money set aside that you can cover that and not miss payments on the student loans? And finally, can you accept the risk? If you do miss a few payments, what is the effect does that have on your credit score or other debt that you have out there? Um, so all those questions combined um, it are things to consider before deciding to take a loan. Um, and if there is a gap to pay for college, so whatever financial aid package you get and what the cost of college is and there's that annual gap, it's, you know, we, we will discuss various strategies with you to how to fund that gap. Um, if we go to the next three slides, actually, um, the next three slides, we created a model family and looks what happens to them based on their retirement, based on the different funding options that they decide to take to help fund their children's college education. Um, so we have Joe and Jane Smith. I know very creative names. <laughs> um, both are 55 years of age. Their combined annual income is 150,000. Their annual household expenses are 100,000. Their total assets are 930,000. That's comprised of 30,000 in a savings account, 100,000 in a taxable investment account. And both Jane and Joe, uh, Joe and Jane each have 400,000 in an IRA. Um, they're both planning on working another 10 years, so they want to retire at age 65. We modeled this scenario that their life expectancy goes to age 90. And some of the assumptions we made were that their investments were going to, going to grow annually at 6% and their rate of inflation was 2.3%. And uh, Joe and Jane have two children. They have Michael and Mary. Michael is 18 and he just started college this month in the fall. So he's a freshman and Mary is 17. She's going to be a senior in high school and she will start college in the fall of 2021. Um, so for three years, uh, Joe and Jane will have two kids in college. Um, this first slide shows what happens if the parents don't help with college at all and they just let whether, you know, there's enough money, they get enough aid from schools or through student loans that they don't take loans and they don't touch any of their retirement plans. Um, based on the assumed, assumed investment rates, Joe and Jane will have almost 1.9 million at the age of 90. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, we're looking at, now, let's say they pay for college from the retirement assets. So they've talked, Joe and Jane have talked, and they've talked with their kids, and they decided they're going to contribute $100,000 for each of their kids' education, so $200,000 in total. Um, based on this and using, you know, savings, their savings account, their taxable investments and money from their IRA, at age 90, 
Joe and Jane will have about 650,000 in assets. So you can see there's a huge drop between if they've done nothing and between using their uh, assets uh, to pay for college. It's a almost one in one million two hundred fifty thousand dollar difference. So it's a huge difference, and again, always something to consider. And on the next slide, we looked at the parents take out a parent plus loan. So they they said we don't want to touch our retirement assets. We're going to take out a hundred thousand in loans for each children. So each year they take out twenty five thousand in loans. So at the end of all four years of college for each kid, they'll have eight loans of twenty five thousand each, which will be two hundred thousand in total. To keep the math simple, we assumed an interest rate of five percent on each loan and each loan is paid monthly over a 10 year period. So what happens when they take this loan out? Let's say both kids have just graduated from college or Michael's out for a year. Joe and Jane are paying off the eight loans all at once and their total monthly payments are almost $2,200 a month or 26,000 uh, per year. So essentially as they're getting closer to retirement, their expenses are increasing when you know, you almost hope the opposite will happen. As you get closer to retirement, you want to save more and more. And this way you can either retire earlier, you can retire on time. Having that extra debt doesn't necessarily advance you towards retirement. Um, and under this scenario, Joe and Jane will be left with about 570000 when they're 90 years old. So what can we conclude? Well, first, this is a model family and every case is going to be different. So there's no answer. There's no answer that we can give, be given on a specific uh, basis for each family. Each one of you are going to have a different situation um, and you'll have a different way to fund college if that's the way um, you decide to go. There's no easy answer when it comes to paying for college. Um, in most cases, we expect that taking loans will work out more favorably than using retirement assets to pay for college. But again, that's on a case by case basis. There's no like line in the sand that that's what's going to work and finally with advanced planning we're able to model the best scenario to pay for college so whether that's having the student borrow or the parent borrow or, or some combination of the two we'll kind of come up with the best way to fund that educational gap that may be there um, and now i'll send it over to josh all right thanks thanks john um so Real quick, I'm, I'm Josh Bennett, um, as Matt, Matt introduced. So I'm founder and managing partner of Vincere Wealth Management. So a uh, quick background on how I got into the whole college funding space. I actually am the son of a professor, and so I sort of grew up around academia. Um, haven't put any kids through college yet like John has, but uh, definitely a, a lot of experience being around academia. Um, but yeah, so in terms of kind of picking up where John left off, so one of the reasons we you know, college can be, and paying for these lump sum, you know, giant college expenses these days can be so so detrimental to a lot of families is, you know, as John mentioned, the, the student loan debt or paying from assets, one of the things that, you know, a lot of retirees, you know, as you're kind of approaching retirement, don't necessarily consider is that, you know, as you're approaching retirement, time isn't necessarily on your side. And one of the biggest risks out there for retirees, especially with, you know, the timing of college payments tends to hit relatively near the, uh, the start of retirement for a lot of families or a lot of parents. One of the risks out there is what's called sequence of returns. And the idea here is that, you know, when you, you know, spend money or if there's a big market drop, AKA you just lose money in the markets, you're in a position where now what you need to do is you have less money kind of recouping and recovering to help fund your overall retirement. So if you look at this slide, this kind of shows two different scenarios where basically you start spending down your money, but in the kind of bottom scenario, there's a big bear market or, you know, it's the same thing, like similar to like, you know, you, you shell out a couple hundred thousand dollars for kids retirement. And now basically as you're spending down that money in retirement, it makes it harder and harder to recover. So you end up basically with, you know, running out of money much quicker than you otherwise would have. Whereas if, for example, you, aren't spending down that money and um, there's a good market, your money could last significantly longer. So as you're going into retirement, the thing to consider is that you're gonna be spending that money down most likely. And as you spend it down, if you, you know, send out a, a big check to a, a, you know, college prior to it, and as of right now, I mean, 
as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, the markets are at all-time highs right now, uh, or at least were <laughs> about a week ago. And so there's a lot of risk out there in the markets. So the thing posing a lot of people in your position is that there's this college bill looming, plus there's a potential for a market correction looming. So if you're you know, on the verge of retirement, this is a real risk for you to guys to consider. But I don't want to, and you know, don't harp on this too much, but something I want to show and why this is such a factor too is losses become exponential. So for example, if you have $100,000 and you lose say 30%, well, now you have $70,000. And if you, you know, try to get back to break even of $100,000, you actually have to gain 43% to get back to break even. Um, so you're actually having to gain more because you have that $70,000 that is going back to $100,000. So for example, and now if you lose 50%, so, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be lost in the market, again, kind of to the situation we were just describing, it could be, you know, say you have a million dollar portfolio, but you have two kids going to two $200,000 schools, and now you have, you know, a 40% you know, loss because of collegiate spending, plus the market goes down, say 10, 20%. Well, you could easily be at a 50% loss on a, a large portfolio. And so now say that brings you to 50,000 to get back to break even, you have to gain 100%. And you can just see like as the, you go down in value or down in numbers, so 75%, you now have to gain 400% to get back to break even. So it becomes more and more detrimental. So the bigger and bigger your college bill, the, the more and more this hurts, especially if you combine that with a down market. So, you know, obviously we, you know, we talk, extensively about how we can lower that burden from the college perspective. But one of the things that you want to do to basically hedge your bets on the investment side is really kind of think through risk in your portfolio when it comes to how you're investing. Um, and also seeing ways you can maximize your investments in ways such as like minimizing the costs of those investments. So for example, to this is something that a lot of people aren't aware of is if you take like an average mutual fund, um, and this study was done by the, the CFA Institute, so the you know, Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts. But most people kind of think of investment costs as just like the management fee. Um, but when you actually kind of peel the layers back of the onion, there's actually a lot more costs baked in. So for example, if you look at a mutual fund in a non-taxable account, such as like a 401k or Roth IRA, or something like that, the total costs end up being about, on average, 3.17%. So if you put that into perspective, say on average, the stock market returns 10%. Well, if that mutual fund costs you three, a little over 3%, say now you're down into about the, the high sixes. Well, there's also gonna be inflation baked in, which is gonna be probably two and a half percent. So now you're, well, about about three and a half percent. So you're not above, not far uh, above an you know an average savings account through history. So you're taking a lot of risk, and you're not necessarily getting a lot of return. Um, and if you add taxes into the mix in a taxable account, it can get even more painful, where the the cost can be over four percent. And that's just because of the nature of how these investments are structured. Um, so there are different types of investments out there that are more efficient, such as like exchange traded funds. Uh, investing in individual stocks, individual bonds, um, and what's called like asset location, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But there are ways to be much more efficient with your your costs and um, how things are baked into your portfolio. But it's definitely something you want to be really cognizant of how much you're spending on your investments because those are going to eat away your returns. And as we you know, kind of just shown, those returns are going to be very important, especially when you factor in these large college bills. Emma, kick back over to, to John. Great, thank you, Josh. Um, so this next slide features annual rank performances of the major asset classes in the US and international markets over the past 20 years. Now, I'm gonna give you a little bit of time. I want you to take a good look at it and come up with what kind of pattern you see. Yeah, if you're still trying to figure it out, you're right. There's really no pattern at all to this. Um, and the lack of any type of pattern shows that the performance of the asset classes from year to year is unpredictable. 
And we can kind of show that if, if you can see it from the slide, and I don't know if you can, if you look at 2007, 2008, and 2009, that little orange tab is emerging market equities. So in 2007, they were up 39.4%, well above the next highest one, which was 16%. So, hey, I want to chase returns. Emerging markets looks like where I want to be. I'm going to jump in and buy them. You jump in in 2008, and lo and behold, look all the way at the bottom, 53.3% they were down. You're like, well, forget that. That didn't work. I want out. And again, lo and behold, 2009 blew everybody out of the competition. They were up 70, almost 79%. Um, so this basically shows, you know, it's almost impossible to chase returns. Um, and we always talk about when we built, you know, when Josh, Jim, and myself build portfolios, um, we always talk about diversifying amongst access classes. And there's really two purposes for that is, one, investors will be well positioned to seek returns whenever and wherever they occur. And two, diversification reduces the risk of being heavily invested in an underperforming asset in any given year. Um, so we can conclude from this that, listen, nobody has a crystal ball. I don't care who they are. Nobody knows what the future holds. And if we all did, none of us would be here right now because we'd all be gazillionaires. So it's not like chasing the hot stock, chasing the hot um, asset class it, year to year, as this chart shows, it, it's going to change. And it's very almost impossible to predict from year to year, which asset class is going to do the best. Um, and also diversifying amongst the asset classes also is going to lower the overall risk of the portfolio. Um, like you can see, if you go to the annualized all the way to the right, you can see um, emerging markets was the third highest portfolio return over the last 20 years. It was 8.52%. But if you look at it, I mean, orange is up and down, up and down to the extremes. You are going to have a lot of sleepless nights. Um, if that was your sole, it was that you had all your equities in emerging markets, you were up a lot of nights over the last 20 years. Yes, the return was great, but you had a lot of up and down returns. So again, diversification amongst different asset classes definitely brings the risk in and you don't have the fluctuations as you would if you were just in one asset class. Um, we can go to the next slide, Josh. And now we're gonna dive into the behavioral side of investing in, you know, all three of us could talk about this for hours. I mean, this is the, I think the biggest thing about how to invest. Um, and, Quite honestly, if we gave this presentation last year, we would be talking about the mortgage crisis of 2008 and 2009. But unfortunately for all of us, the last seven or eight months, we've been living in a crisis. And that's obviously COVID. Um, even before talking about investments, um, I know everybody's been affected by this, by this, and it's, you know, are my kids going to go to school? If they are, is it virtual or should I send them and person. Uh, I know there's a lot of people out there who've, you know, their income's decreased and it's like, when am I going to start getting my income back? Am I going to start getting my income back? Um, also, even if family is getting invited to a party, you know, should we accept it or are we worried about our health? So there's a lot of different things there that you have to worry about. The one thing is if you had a, a really good, well-built portfolio that's one of the things that you really shouldn't have to worry about in here. And I'll go through some of the reasons why. Um, a lot of reasons why are invest for people invest and why are their returns less than actually what investment returns are? It's two things, investor discipline and their psychology. Um, people really struggle to separate their emotions from their investment decisions. You know, the idea behind investing is to buy low and sell high, yet most of us allow our emotions, which usually brings the opposite effect. So if you can look at this little chart here to the left where you have optimism, you see the market start going up and you're like, oh, I'm going to miss out. I have to jump in. Um, it's going to keep going higher and you end up buying. And all of a sudden the market turns and it starts coming down a little bit and there's some negative headlines and you have to make the decision. You know what, do I hold on or do I get out? And next thing you know, the market starts, you know, crapping out and going lower and lower. And you're like, oh, I have to get out. It's just going to keep going. There's no bottom in sight. You get out. 
and it may go down a little bit more, but then again, it turns up and you're, and you're like, well, is this just going to be a little bit of a bounce or is it going to keep running up and it keeps going up and you're like, well, I have to get in and you end up buying. So you're basically chasing returns, which is something that we never want to do. Um, it's extremely difficult to accurately time what the market's going to do on a consistent basis. And let's just look at COVID as a perfect example, and we'll use the S&P 500 um, as the example. So from the middle of February to the middle of March, the S&P dropped about 35%. After we reached the bottom in March, the S&P proceeded to put it to March all the way up. And on September 2nd, it actually put in an all-time high. I doubt there was anybody out there who would have been able to predict um, that that would have happened. I, I don't care who the expert is, who it was, nobody could have said from the bottom in March, there's no way in six months time or five months time even that we're gonna be able to put in an all time high in um, the stock market. So, you know, the key takeaways from this are, you know, when Josh, Jim and myself, we sit down with our clients, um, what we really like to discuss with them is, you know, what goals they have and what the time horizons are for those goals and make sure we have a strong investment philosophy to guide our clients. Short term needs. So short term needs, let's say paying for college. Um, if you have to buy a car, uh, let's say you have to do a repair to the house, anything that's in the, you know, one, two, three year time range, we want that money safe and secure. So we'll recommend CDs, high yield saving accounts short duration bond funds, anything that's really not gonna fluctuate so that when you need that money, that money's there for you. Um, other, for money that doesn't need to be touched over a 10 year period um, or longer, you know, we allocate that much differently than short term money and we build a portfolio to withstand market downturns that we've seen in COVID. And also if you look at the mortgage crisis of 2008, 2009, um, we had a nice downturn there and then you have the recovery. So as history has continually shown us, markets will rebound um, from market downturns if the portfolio is given the market enough time to correct. Markets have always uh, rewarded discipline. And now on this slide, it, it's kind of, I'm sure you've all heard the saying, control what you can control and don't worry about the other stuff. Um, we live in a world right now where there are tons of news sources and it comes at you 24 hours a day and everybody wants to you know be the headline that makes news um what you have to realize is all these tv commentators all these strategists that work at financial institutions um, they're all paid to have some kind of view they may not have a view but then they'll get fired and somebody will hire them who does have a view so they always have to put something out and again the more shocking it is the better because that sells news that sells you know has you tune into tv channels um so it's all noise you want to really have a well-built portfolio and get rid of the noise um and having the right built portfolio around your goals and dreams will withstand all the outside influence as history has always shown us um through the last you know almost 80 years uh, and I'll leave you before I turn it over to Jim is just one things I, I one of the things I always tell my clients is we can't direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails to get you to where you want to go. Um, and now I'll send it over to Jim. Uh, actually, Josh, but <laughs> we'll, get Josh, Jim. We'll, we'll, we'll get to Jim. We'll get to Jim. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so in terms of like kind of continuing down this line of how you can sort of protect your assets for retirement. Um, you know, obviously we've been kind of beaten up on paying for college, uh, but kind of the other thing that, uh, you know, essentially is trying to, you know, for lack of a better term, trying to pickpocket you during retirement is, is taxes. So Uncle Sam is coming after your money as well. So when you think about kind of preparing and protecting these assets for retirement, we want to come up with a strategy to be as tax efficient as possible as well. Um, just because that's where you're going to, you know, for example, most of us are going to spend the majority of our money in retirement on either our lifestyle or taxes. Um, and especially in the position we're right in right now, you know, uh, with COVID going on, uh, I'm sure you a lot of you are painfully aware that right now the debt in our country is is pretty much skyrocketing just with the amount of money we're having to spend to keep the economy afloat. Well, ultimately that tax bill's gotta get, or that bill's gotta get paid somehow. And the, the likely scenario for that bill getting paid back is, is taxes getting raised. 
I mean, just to put it in perspective, right now, we're in about countrywide, about $30 trillion in debt. And to put that in perspective, we are spending about three and a, or we actually, we raise about three and a half trillion dollars in tax revenue each year, but we're spending about five to six trillion a year right now. So even if we use every dollar that our country makes in tax revenue each year, it would still take us over 10 years to pay back our debt. So that's, that kind of shows you like, you know, the tax rates are going to have to go up um, and they're likely going to go up if not before your retirement in the midst of your retirement. And so you really want to be tax efficient because that's where, you know, as we showed from the investment piece earlier, you know, that's going to be a big, big ticket item for you. Uh, and so when you think about having a tax efficient retirement, there's really three different buckets. So you have the tax free investments, which that's like your Roth IRAs. Um, life insurance could be one of those buckets as well. Uh, there's tax deferred investments. So this is where majority of the, the bulk of people's savings are in like 401ks and traditional IRAs and you have your taxable investments such as stocks, uh, mutual funds and cash that you have in just taxable accounts. So most people have probably 80% of their money in tax deferred investments um, where realistically you want about 80% in tax free investments kind of going into the current status we're in um, just because that's going to be what really protects you um, you know, in protects your wealth as we, as we kind of go into the next couple decades. Um, even as of right now, as you're kind of managing your current assets, there are ways to be more tax efficient, even within the different structures you have. Like, so say you have all three of these as um, different accounts. Well, you can do what's called asset location. So one issue in terms of being tax efficient is that not every investment type is created equal when it comes to a tax perspective. And the reason for that is, Things like capital gains on stocks, if you're looking at like long-term capital gains, so say you hold a stock for over a year, your tax rate's gonna be about 15%. Whereas if you hold it for less than a year, it's gonna be your income tax rate. If you have dividends from that stock or have dividends from or interest from say a, a bond, those are taxable at your, your income rates. So, and for example, like there's things like, you know, real estate investment trusts that may put out 10% in terms of income. So all these different investment types have different tax abilities. And so therefore they're going to be more appropriate as you're, you know, kind of following John's lead and diversifying amongst different asset classes. You want to make sure those asset classes are kind of placed in the right account from a tax perspective. So for example, like if you look at this image, you know, a tax free municipal bond, that is a bond that gives you tax free income well, it doesn't really make sense to have that in a tax deferred account because you're not getting taxed on anyways. Um, so that's a type of investment that would be great for a taxable account. Whereas something like a real estate investment trust that has a ton of income, that's going to be a great one for a tax deferred or tax exempt account. So you want to be just strategic as you're building out your diversification, as you're investing in different asset classes, just be kind of cognizant of where you're, you're putting those different investments because um, that's going to really save you a bunch of money in terms of how much taxes you're going to pay. And realistically, it, if you, you could have the same exact investments, but just put in the wrong accounts and you could be actually having significantly more taxes from year to year just by not shifting them around in the right places. So just being aware of the different taxation of these different types of investments can go a long way. Another thing you can do for like sort of long-term tax management strategies and kind of going back to that 80% you know, ideally want in a uh, tax-free account if possible is you can do what is called a Roth conversion. So if you have a lot of your savings in say a tax deferred account, such as like a 401k or an IRA, right now the IRS allows you to do what's called a Roth conversion, which is basically where you take that money that's in the 401k or in an IRA and you can convert that into a Roth. Um, so aka a tax-free bucket. So you can take it from a tax deferred bucket, which basically what that means is you got the you got the tax deduction on it when you put money into that bucket. And now when you take it out in retirement, it's going to be taxed. And so, you know, as we mentioned earlier, it's going to be likely taxed at a higher tax rate later on. So what you can do is you can say, hey, I know the tax rates are pretty low today. I have a good feeling that they're going to go up here in the next, you know, five, 10 years or whatever taxes end up going up. Obviously, we have no way of predicting that, but we can say, okay, I'm, I'm going to take what I know today, kind of control the controllables and say, I, I want to convert to a Roth. And 
what happens is when you take the money out of the tax deferred account, so when you start that conversion, basically you take it out of the tax deferred accounts, the 401k, the IRA, it gets taxed in that year. So it counts as like income for that year, but then you convert it over to the Roth and you never pay taxes on it again. Um, so even if tax rates go up, you're not concerned about it because you're now protected from taxes in that account. So I put together this, this sort of visual to just show you kind of the impacts. And the idea is that, you know, we're, we're drawing about 110,000 uh, for income and retirement. We're starting with a million dollars in 401ks, IRAs. Um, and, you know, right now we have uh, about a uh, $165,000 uh, pre-retirement salary. So if we did convert that million dollars over five years versus not, not converting it, if you see at the bottom, if we didn't, didn't do anything over the course of a retirement, say, you know, from now to the, say age 90, so we're 60 right now, we're gonna pay $906,000 in taxes. And that's at today's rates. So if, if tax rates go up, it's gonna be more than that. Whereas if we did the Roth conversion, we can't avoid the taxes. We're still gonna to have to pay taxes on that money that we convert. But if you can see a long-term, it ends up being about 566 thousand in taxes instead of 900. So that just doing a Roth conversion with all things being equal saved us about $400,000 just in taxes. And if rates go up, that's going to be even more. So, so you can kind of see here that, you know, this is an easy way to really save a boatload of money over the course of time. And the nice thing too, is because you, once that money's in to a Roth, you can still invest it. So now you're just investing in tax free. So you're able to, even though if you pay taxes today, you're able to build that money back up with some because you have the, you know, the, the huge tax savings there. So all in all, these are, uh, these type of strategies can save you a ton of money if, if used um, in an intelligent way as you go into, into, into retirement. And I mean, if you know, kind of circling back to the college piece, I mean, right now, that $400,000 in tax savings alone could pay for basically two college educations right there. Um, so definitely want to have a strategy for, for how to minimize the, these tax bills as well as um, protecting your investments along the way. And now I'm going to kick it over to, to John. Or sorry, Jim. All right, everyone, you saved the best for last here. Uh, my name is, is Jim Femia. I am from Appella Capital. My office is in, in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Um, I am the, the elder statesman of the group here. I have been in the financial services industry for, for almost 30 years, and I've been an independent fee-only financial advisor for, for the last 25 years. Uh, I am about to enter my 13th year in the college planning space, and initially I got involved to help my clients and, and people I knew in the community to figure out how the heck were they gonna get their kids through college without jeopardizing their own retirements. So as, as we work through the financial planning process with our clients, one subject that we always need to address is the subject of, of estate planning. It is a, a very important component of a comprehensive financial plan, but unfortunately it, it's often neglected. Now, I am not a licensed estate planning attorney, so I'm not gonna give you any specific estate planning advice. Uh, but I've been doing this for quite a while, like I said, and there are some common practices that I'd just like to, to share with you tonight that I think may be helpful for where you are at, at this point in your life. Um, and again, always consult with a licensed estate planning attorney in your state uh, to fully execute your plan, because as you may know, uh, some of the laws will differ from, from state to state. So let me start with a, with a definition. There are lots of definitions out there. Um, I prefer the ones that are simple and easy to understand. Um, this definition comes from, from Wealth Council. Um, Wealth Council is a nationwide network of independent estate planning attorneys um, who all take a similar approach to the estate planning process. Um, and again, so their definition is to ensure your wishes are carried out. You need to provide instructions stating whom you want to receive something of yours, what you want them to receive, and when they are to receive it. You will, of course, want this to happen with the least amount paid in taxes, legal fees, and court costs. That is estate planning, making a plan in advance and naming who you want to receive the things you own after you die, right? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. How do I get my property to the ones I love in the quickest, cheapest, tax-efficient manner? 
Go ahead, Josh. Josh, can you move the slide? Yep, sorry, technical difficulty. No worries, no worries. Um, so, according to caring.com, believe it or not, almost one half of all Americans over the age of 55 have not done any estate planning whatsoever. And there are really three, three common reasons for it. Number one is, first off, it, it's not an easy subject to face, right? Who wants to talk about dying or your spouse dying or becoming disabled or in, incapacitated? It, it's terrible to think about. And many of us will just sort of avoid the subject and, and not deal with it at all. But as we all know, it's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And when the time does come, you know, in our opinion, you're going to be much better off following your personal instructions, your wishes, um, than those of the court. So it's not an easy subject to face. It's, it's often confusing, right? Wills, trust, healthcare proxies, power of attorneys, your head's going to explode trying to figure out all this jargon. And it can, it can be expensive. If uh, you have a large estate, which requires any sophisticated planning or any sophisticated documents. It can be expensive, but, but for most families, uh, basic estate, estate planning can be, can be very expensive. And I, I always tell people, you know, start out with what you can afford. And some estate planning is actually free, which we'll touch on in just, just a little bit. The second reason people neglect estate planning is a lot of folks think that they don't have enough in, in the way of assets to justify estate planning. And, and the reality is, once you start to add up all of your tangible assets, things like your home, your cars, with your intangible property, like your, your retirement account, or bank accounts, or brokerage accounts, or life insurance policies, um, you may be surprised at how much you actually have. Uh, one of the first exercises we always go through during the financial planning process is to compile a net worth statement. And I can't tell you how many times clients have said to me, wow, I never realized, never realized how much I had. And the value of your estate and any specific health care concerns that may be um, uh, with your family, such as a disability or special needs child, um, those things will really determine the, the complexity of the plan. The third reason that people don't deal with estate planning is people tend to procrastinate. But I always like to remind folks, you know, everyone has an estate plan. Even if you haven't proactively put together your own plan, the state has an estate plan in place just for you. Like I said earlier, you'd much prefer to have um, your plans put in place instead of the state's. One, one point that I would like to make here is the importance of, of proper account registration or how your accounts are titled and beneficiary designations. Now, I just mentioned earlier, some estate planning and free, is free, and here's, here's a good example of it. If you simply name and update your beneficiaries on all of your retirement accounts and your life insurance policies, and those beneficiaries are up to date, all of your assets are going to flow to your intended parties without the court's involvement, and without any additional expenses. So if you've been through a divorce or a separation, um, had the death of a spouse, you want to make sure that your beneficiaries are up to date. And I would encourage all of you to take a look and review those beneficiaries, at least on an annual basis. It's a, it's a good habit to get into. Also, any non-retirement non accounts, like a bank account or a brokerage account, you should also consider naming either a joint account holder um, or a transfer on death or a TOD to the account, which will serve as a beneficiary designation. Just so you're aware, if you pass, you own any accounts individually in your name only without a beneficiary, in most cases, those accounts are now going to need to go through the probate process, which chances are you'd rather avoid. Okay, Josh, next slide. So those of you that have kids in college or about to head off to college, um, we would strongly encourage you to consider having these three estate documents in place. Now, since most college students are at least 18 years old, technically they're adults. For all this, so this rule in HIPAA, uh, parents have no legal right to the adult children's medical records or other healthcare related information. This can make it difficult, if not impossible, for parents to step in and assist 
if their student is going to need medical help, especially from a distance. So in a perfect world, hopefully you'll never need to rely on these forms. But however, it's, it's always better to be prepared if things don't go as planned. So we would suggest that you take a few hours and, and, and obtain and complete these documents. Um, keep copies of them on your, your phone or your computer so that you can easily access them if necessary. So these three documents would be a, a HIPAA authorization, which is a legal document that allows your students health information to be disclosed to a third party, most likely a parent, um, a medical or healthcare power of attorney. This document allows your students to designate another person to be their agent in case they can't make decisions regarding their own health care, and then a durable power of attorney as well, which will allow parents to make financial transactions or, or sign legal documents. So again, it'd be a great idea to have these three in place before your kids head off to school. Okay, hey, Josh. So whenever you experience a significant change to your life, whether it's you know, a marriage, a home purchase, a birth of a child, uh, maybe relocating to a different state, um, an inheritance or, or a pending retirement, these type of lifestyle changes should lead you towards updating both your estate and your financial plan. Let us suggest that sending a child off to college and all the associated costs that go along with that is such a change that should lead you guys to take action. Now, you made the decision to work with CFS to help prepare you for college. Now it's time to get serious about preparing for, for your own potential retirement at some point in the future. Now, back in 2001, Vanguard released a study called Advisor Alpha, and they've released several updates over the years. As a matter of fact, they released an update last year in 2019. And in this study, Vanguard has outlined how working with an advisor can add value or alpha uh, by providing relationship-oriented services such as portfolio construction, tax planning, uh, minimizing expenses, behavioral coaching, and just financial guidance as uh, in general. All the things that, that Josh and John and myself have been discussing tonight. Um, the challenge has always been in our industry is quantifying that value. It's not, it's not easy to do, but Vanguard has spent a lot of time and resources in, in trying to actually quantify the value here. And if it was just about improved uh, portfolio performance, it would be relatively easy to do. But the reality is it's not just about better performance. It's more about what you're able to keep as, a, as an investor, not your rate of return. So they've been able to highlight certain uh, behavioral challenges here and have associated an improved performance number to each of these things. So as you notice, the second one down, cost-effective implementation or reducing your expense ratios, that's gonna add about a half of 1% to your overall performance by minimizing those expenses. Rebalancing the portfolio on an annual basis. Um, so if you have a 60-40 allocation, once a year, you're gonna bring back to those target allocations. That's gonna improve your performance by about a third of a 1%. Um, John had talked earlier about behavioral coaching, right? Keeping you focused, keeping you committed to the plan, keeping you calm during market turmoils. That, that type of coaching could potentially add up to a percent and a half to your overall performance. You go through all these different um, advisor um, services, and at the end of the day, it's going to add about 3% to your overall performance, which is, which is not chump change. If you're able to do 5% on your own, if you're able to do 8% by working with an advisor over a 10, 15, 20 year period, it's going to, it's going to make a market um, improvement to your, to your overall success. Okay, Josh. So the decisions you need to make at this point, just as you did with college, is this. Do you want to do this on your own? Do you want to do it on your own by yourself? Or do you want to team up with a professional who will help guide you through the financial planning process, implement a plan, and most importantly, to, to keep you on track? So if you decide that you would like to explore this working with a professional, let me suggest that you focus on a few important factors here as you begin, begin to do some research. So as you start to interview or consider potential advisors, um, we would strongly recommend that you find an advisor who is, is independent. 
you want to work with someone who has no motivation to promote or recommend any, speci any specific investment product or program. You don't want to have a financial advisor who has some financial conflicts of interest. You'd also suggest you work with someone that's, that's fee only, that's not paid on commissions. You want to work with someone who's on the same side of the financial as you are, where the structure is set up where the better you do, the better the advisor does from a compensation standpoint. You should try to find someone that serves as a fiduciary that's by law to always do what's in the best interest of their clients. Fiduciaries are typically seen to have no conflicts of interest. You also want to be comfortable with their overall investment philosophy, right? You want to find someone that has a similar philosophy. And you want to be sure that the financial advisor can very easily explain their overall investment philosophy. You don't want anything that's too complicated. And then finally, as you do your research, we would recommend that you find someone that takes a financial planning approach. You always want to look for someone who, who first wants to develop a deep understanding of your goals, your needs, your wishes, asks great questions, is an active listener, and first goes through the financial planning process before they start to provide, provide investment solutions. Go ahead, Josh. So let, let us wrap up with the, the, the following um, recommendation. I, I hope if you learn one thing tonight, it, it's this. You need to be proactive, okay? You don't wanna wing this. This is not something you wanna to try to figure out as you go, because when you, when, you, when you have to make financial decisions under duress, it, it, it's at times like that where you end up making major mistakes. So you really wanna be proactive. And now is the opportune time to take a fresh look at your situation and put a plan in place. So my recommendation would be for those of you that have a relationship with a, with a trusted advisor, whether it's a CPA, a financial planner, an attorney, you want to schedule an appointment with that person right away. And you want to get a handle on or do an analysis. First off, your current assertion. You want to be comfortable with the way your money is currently allocated, the risks that are associated with it, and the fees that you're paying for that investment. Are your college plan matching up with your retirement goals? Again, like we had talked about earlier. Are there things you can do to reduce your taxes? But remember, every dollar that you save in taxes is money that you can earmark to other areas, whether it's paying for college or saving for retirement. Do you have proper insurance coverage or consider umbrella, umbrella coverage or long-term care insurance? If your advisor is, is unable to help you in this endeavor, um, you need to do one of two things. You need to either figure this out on your own or you need to find someone that can help you. Maybe you found someone tonight. That's our only sales pitch for the night, folks. So as a courtesy to anyone who attends um, tonight's seminar, we are going to be offering a free, no obligation, 20 minute phone consultation to answer any specific questions uh, that you may have on either your own situation or to learn more about how we actually work. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for their time and I would like to throw it back to Matt for a wrap up and maybe any Q&A. All right, guys, listen, I thought financial aid was born. That's, uh, that was a whole nother level. <laughs> um, I kid, I kid, you, you, you guys did a great job. Um, so here's, you know, like I said at, at, at the top of this, I mean, we've, we've been at this for a long time, but we're, uh, we have tunnel vision a little bit. And part of that is, is beneficial and that we're very good at what we do, which is specifically the college piece, but we have blind spots. And we've realized that more and more over the years. And that's why we try to bring in folks uh, like these gentlemen that, that uh, this is their area of expertise, because sometimes what's a great college recommendation it's going to screw you on taxes or screw you on retirement or vice versa so it's it, it's it's all about finding that holistic uh approach and, and and i actually think it's uh our models are very similar in that what we try to do with cfs this has always been our model and this is why i think we're aligned uh jim josh uh john and myself and and bill and our our, our firms as a whole is you know, we try to lead with uh, education and, and, and value. And there's always going to be a percent of people that see our presentations and say, awesome. Now, I, you guys just gave me the secret sauce. 
I'm going to go do it on my own and I'm going to be really successful. And that's, that's perfect. We encourage that. And there's going to be a percentage of, of you, hopefully that are on here tonight, having the same experience. I mean, you're going to get this recording, you're going to have the slides and you guys just got the secret sauce. And for those of you that feel comfortable uh, executing that, we encourage you to do so. Uh, for those of you that have more questions or feel like you could use uh, additional help for from you know uh, professionals that have been in this space or, or you know this is their area of expertise um, you know we encourage you to take them up on a 20-minute consultation we'll to get more uh, personal to your particular situation because obviously we have to keep it somewhat broad tonight we got to keep it within an hour uh, like I stated at the top we got a NFL kickoff in about 20 minutes here um, so hopefully you found some value tonight. Uh, you know where to find us. If, if, if there are any follow-up questions, we'll be proactive with you. Um, and if you want to meet with any of these gentlemen, uh, I know that they'll be happy to do so. And, and we really appreciate you uh, joining us as always and, and look forward to continuing on the journey uh, with you guys and your families. Thanks, everybody.